On Monday, the Vatican announced that Pope Francis will replace the Holy See's top financial regulator amid a brewing financial scandal over church investments in London real estate. Rene Brulhart's mandate as president of the Vatican's Financial Information Authority, or AIF, will not be renewed. The Vatican confirmed that the Pope has chosen Brulhart's replacement, but will not make an announcement until next week. Joining me now with analysis is the Rome correspondent for the National Catholic Register, Edward Penton. Ed, thanks for being with us. Thanks. Good to be, good now, to be with you. Now, Ed. there has been a lot of movement at the financial regulator's office since the Vatican police raided their offices and those of the Secretary of State in October. Five people have been let go, Ed, and the Vatican's chief of police resigned. What is going on? Well, I think what it shows, Raymond, is that uh, the people are getting to the root of a lot of the financial corruption that's been going on. And uh, that we're seeing a certain uh, reaction to that. Uh, the raid uh, has been inconclusive, but I think what we're seeing is that there are uh, dubious uh, financial transactions that have taken place in the past, mm -hmm. and they're all coming to light. Uh, it's partly also because of a change of personnel. Uh, I think right. the new sostituto, Card um, Archbishop Edgar Pena Parra, is actually doing some quite good things in trying to to shake things up and, and expose some of this uh, wrongdoing. Hmm. Now, the AIF, this regulatory oversight uh, institution within the Vatican, it was established by Pope Benedict XVI back in 2010 to move the Vatican Bank toward compliance with international standards on financial crimes, etc. Now, Rulhard has been president there since 2012, and under his direction, it's been reported, the bank closed thousands of accounts that did not conform to its stated mission. Why did he suddenly quit it? Well, I think although there has been improvement, he has done, he has achieved quite a bit uh, in that position. Uh, but he's gradually had his um, authority and a lot of his powers uh, stripped away. At mm -hmm. one point, uh, the AIF uh, did monitor uh, APSA, which is a dicastery responsible right. for property uh, real estate uh, in the Vatican, and that was taken away from them. Mm. And, and gradually there's been this steady erosion of his powers. And so now I think he felt really that uh, what's the point in carrying on? It became a sort of empty shell. Mm. Now, that's um, speculation. That's from sources that I've heard. I've not heard that from himself. Mm -hmm. But that does seem to be the, the reason behind this. Yeah. Um, and I think uh, his, actually his mandate ended about a few months ago, but uh, but then he was let, uh, let allowed to continue, and then he says that he resigned. Mm -hmm. An international network of financial watchdogs has suspended the Vatican's access to its information. The group is called the Egmont Group. It's a Toronto-based network. It contains more than 160 national financial intelligence units from around the world. And they've decided to suspend the Vatican watchdog from access to their secure website. Though their members share information about everything from money laundering to financing of terrorism, tax fraud, uh, according to people familiar with the matter, they want the Vatican out because they question how credible they are at this point, particularly with this uh, financial regulator leaving. He brought a lot of credibility to the Post, yes? Yes. I mean, it, it did bring a lot of credibility. This this was done under Benedict. Um, but as I say, I think uh, gradually the, these... Um, these uh, regulations that were imposed or enforced by Benedict and then France's uh, were gradually cut away. And, mm. uh, and the, rather, the reforms that were, were hoped for uh, haven't actually materialized. In some senses, they have. But it, generally, I think um, the reforms have not gone as, as people had hoped and that there's still a lot of work to do. Hmm. The Vatican prosecutor's investigation uh, came in response to a complaint from the Vatican Bank when a request came from the Secretariat of State, Cardinal Parolin, for a loan of more than $110 million to finance this property in London that has become so scandalous in recent days. Real estate investments are typically not handled by the Secretariat of State. There are odd silos, as you mentioned earlier, of financial responsibility at the Vatican what does the Secretariat of State control vis-a-vis -vis, uh, financial holdings? I thought uh, OPSA controlled real estate. Well, that's the, that's the issue, uh, Raymond. And what we understand is that APSA usually does. Uh, and so this whole transaction is, is rather dubious. Um, now, he's admitted to handling this. Right. Um, and we're not quite sure why. Uh, 
the, the, the Vatican handles quite a lot of real estate, partly because it was given to the Vatican after the Lateran Pax by, by Mussolini uh, in compensation for the confiscation of the papal states. And so the Vatican has quite a lot of property on its books. Mm -hmm. But even so, this, this is a very dubious one because of the, the fact that the Secretary of State was monitor, um, in charge of it. And, and we don't really know why. But, uh, but it seems to be that the Vatican gets involved or has got involved with rather dubious characters, yeah. um, either intentionally or not. Probably we think not because mm. um, they just don't have the wherewithal to, to investigate these people before they engage with them and, and do business with them. And I yeah. think that's part of the problem. A lot of it um, is incompetence and naivety rather than uh, so much as... Uh, bad wrongdoing or intentional wrongdoing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, they're an easy mark uh, and, and a naive one. Uh, on Tuesday, the Vatican Secretary of State, or Secretary of State, rather, Cardinal Parolin, told Catholic News Agency that he had personally arranged a 2014 loan of 50 million euros from the Vatican Bank to partially fund the purchase of a bankrupt Italian hospital. He then arranged with Cardinal Donald World, former archbishop here in Washington, for a grant from the U.S.-based Papal Foundation to cover the loan when it couldn't be repaid. Now, this story has not played well in the United States. I remember when it first came out. How is Rome reacting to this, that Cardinal Parolin was the instrument of this, uh, this loan that many of the Papal Foundation members considered dubious at best? Yes, well, I, this is a story I'm looking into at the moment, Raymond, and I've, I've got some information, but it's not corroborated, so I can't quite go into it in as much detail as I'd like, but it mm -hmm. does seem to be the case. Uh, the, the Vatican, um, or rather people working for the Vatican, pulled a, uh, a rather deceptive stunt, really, to, mm. to try and get this money uh, from uh, the Bambino Gesù Hospital, a children's hospital mm. in Rome, uh, given to this, this other hospital, it's called the IDI, right. uh, this 50 million euro loan. Um, and uh, it's, it seems to have been passed um, or given the go-ahead by Cardinal Parolin, as he admitted, mm -hmm. but also Pope Francis, of course, gave the go-ahead, uh, uh -huh. even though they were warned against it. But they were persuaded, as I understand, uh, to, to do this deal because they considered it to be uh, genuine and above board. Mm -hmm. um, but against the uh, wishes and advice of Cardinal Pell, who was dead against it, although he could see the, the importance of keeping this IDI hospital mm -hmm. afloat uh, in order to, to retain jobs and so forth. Uh, he did not say that the, he did not agree that this was the way, and yet, uh, by hook or by crook, if you like, it went ahead. And unfortunately, yeah. um, it's uh, it's a big uh, loss. It's 50 million euros, uh, which uh, can never be repaid. So mm. uh, it's a it's a huge mistake, and um, and done really by a lot of smoke and mirrors uh, by yeah. uh, by some other staff um, la laity primarily. Um, mm -hmm. con convincing the Vatican to, to go through with it. So I, again, it's, uh, it seems to be um, uh, incompetence rather than malevolence. I well, uh, members of the Papal Foundation told me personally, Ed, that they were hesitant about this donation when it was first raised, when they f it first came to them, and they questioned whether it was to keep the hospital from closing or to cover bad debt. And the cardinals assured them that the Holy Father wanted it, so basically shut up. Uh, former uh, Cardinal Theodore McCarrick, I remember, told a concerned board member, raising concerns about the donation was irresponsible and seriously harmful to the Papal Foundation. Your thoughts on all this? Yes, I mean, this. Uh, what it seems to be the case is that they were desperate, of course, to get this loan uh, mm -hmm. funded. It was guaranteed, but they, need, they wanted it to... Uh, uh, paid back, and so they came to the Papal Foundation to do that. Uh, and I think relying on the good, good offices and, and good nature and the generosity of American donors. Mm -hmm. um, and this uh, obviously was not acceptable. But I think what's important to point out here too, Raymond, is that this goes back. It's not really Pope Francis um, so much. So all of these, these, uh, a lot of these uh, dubious transactions date mm -hmm. back to Cardinal Bertoni. Uh, under right. Benedict, uh, the former Secretary, Secretary of State. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of these things were put in place then. So uh, it's not really fair to blame uh, Pope Francis for this. Um, mm -hmm. I think although there has been obviously a lot of uh, incompetence and, and mismanagement uh, yeah. under his 
watch. I well, think a lot I'll, of this began l long before and, he, he arrived. And, and, and viewers may or may not know. I mean, I certainly didn't know what the Papal Foundation was before I came to this post. The Papal Foundation is a group of very well-heeled uh, uh, and wealthy Catholic donors. Uh, these people tend to be very involved in their faith, but they're captains of industry, so they know how to balance a, a ledger sheet. And they raise questions about the millions that they donate. And I do think some of the, the, the cardinals who were on that board, and they are some of the major cardinals in the U.S., were pressuring them to make this donation in spite of their questions and, and despite their better judgment. And that caused a lot of dislocation at the Papal Foundation, which is a whole other story. But uh, I want to move on. Ed, a criminal prosecutor in Argentina has requested the arrest of Bishop Gustavo Zancheta. Now, you'll remember, he was accused of sexually abusing two seminarians. Zacheta was suspended from his position at the Vatican Bank, where he was appointed an assessor by Pope Francis in 2017. Now, Zancheta is currently living at the Casa Santa Marta, the, where the whole Holy Father resides. Do you see him being extradited to Argentina to face these charges? Well, I, I don't know, Raymond. I mean, it's, it's highly likely. I think the Pope, I think, asked for an investigation. He asked for the CDF also to look into this uh, earlier this year. Um, so he's keen that this gets, or well, seems to be keen that this gets, uh, they get to the bottom of this. Um, but uh, it is uh, rather odd. I mean, he's basically uh, on the run, if you like, a fugitive from justice, it seems, uh, living in, in the Casa Santa Marta, in the Pope's residence. So mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't look good. The Pope knows him very well. He was considered um, Cardinal Bergoglio, as he then was, his spiritual father. Um, they were very close. I think he was a deputy within yep. the Bishop's Conference mm -hmm. um, when he was president of the Bishop's Conference. So they know each other very well. Um, and uh, I, th I think the Pope uh, is well aware of what's happened. And uh, it's good, as, I, as you say, it'll be interesting to see just how he yeah. handles this and whether he, he follows um, what the, what the mm -hmm. law wants. Ed, you covered the Vatican Conference last week. It was called Promoting Digital Child Dignity. Uh, and it focused on addressing the online sexual exploitation of children. How is the Vatican involved in this fight? Yes, this is um, a very... Uh, uh, well, it was a very well attended uh, meeting here in the Pontifical Academy for Social Sciences. The, the Vatican has taken quite a strong lead in this, and uh, I think people welcome this very much because uh, the, the, uh, the problem of, of uh, exploitation of children uh, on the Internet and sexual abuse of children through trafficking on the Internet has become a huge problem. The International Center for, um, for uh, ch Child Exploitation and Missing Children uh, said that it was 100,000 uh, children were suspected of abuse online in 2013. Now, that number has soared to apparently 18 million last year. So it's a huge problem. And, of course, there's, there's all sorts of problems with the Internet and children accessing mm -hmm. it. Um, and this, this conference really aimed to try to, to find uh, action to deal with this and come to uh, uh, agreement both with um, uh, mm -hmm. technology companies. Microsoft was here. Uh, we had... Um, also other people from NGOs and interreligious leaders too. There were lots of Muslims here and, 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 uh, and Jews as well. And they were all trying to find ways to help uh, protect children online. And I think it was a very, um, seemed to be a very successful um, in conference and that they came up with a six-point action plan at the end to, to really try to address it. Mm -hmm. uh, before I let you go, last week it was announced that Cardinal George Pell would be allowed to appeal his case before the High Court in Australia. And a day after that announcement, Pope Francis appointed his replacement, a fellow Jesuit, Reverend Juan Antonio Guerrero Alves. Now, he will be the new Vatican finance minister. Is he up to the challenge, Ed? Uh, I'm reading reports that he really has no financial experience. I mean, not, not over large institutions anyway. Yes, it's a, it is a rather odd appointment, Raymond. I mean, he, he's been at the Vatican... Um, in a quite a responsible job since 2017, looking after the provincials, um, the different area, different provinces of uh, Jesuit provinces around the world from from Rome. Um, he's got a degree in economics before he entered the priesthood. So he's got some expertise, but um, but people say not really enough to deal with this kind of work. Um, mm -hmm. But at the same time, Cardinal Pell, of course, didn't have 
uh, huge amounts of expertise either, but he did have a, a good nous, we, we believe, mm -hmm. for, for dealing with this kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. But we're not sure quite what, what he brings to this role. Um, mm. But uh, I think the Pope is, interesting thing is the Pope is appointing more and more Jesuits to, I noticed that. to front, um, uh, to become front positions. And this is, this is an interesting perspective, I think, because usually Jesuits take a back seat. Mm -hmm. um, they try to not take um, these uh, high profile positions. Uh, but the Pope is pushing them forward uh, to take to take them, and I think probably because he feels that he can trust Jesuits more than any others, and so um, I think that's part of it. But mm. uh, but we'll have to see how he how he does with this because yeah. it, it's um, it's interesting, as you say, given his uh, lack of qualifications. In yeah, a way. we'll see how this shakes out. And uh, I'm I'm uh, thinking of uh, my old friend Cardinal Schalke, who uh, was head of the the governato there at the Holy See, and. Though he was resisted for years internally, he was one of the few uh, uh, governors of, of any financial institutions or properties that were able to bring the books to the black and, and took everything out of the red. And he instituted some protocols and, and reforms that the moment he left and John Paul II closed his eyes, all those reforms got, you know, run over with the ivy of the Vatican and, and swept away. But it, we do need people mm. like that who have a kind of a clear, tough eye when it comes to these financial matters. And as I've often said, they should have a forensic audit of every diocese of the world, including the Vatican. Then we know where all the bodies are and, and how everybody is spending this money or not. So, Ed Penton, we'll leave it there. Thank you for your fine reporting. And you can catch Ed's reporting at ncregister.com and follow him on Twitter at Edward Penton. Thanks again, Ed. Thank you, Ed.